So as um, as as uh, you know that we dealt with um, a passing in our family. Uh, our niece Crystal was 29 years old, and she was addicted to heroin for a long time, and uh, was in and out of rehab. And, um, you know, tried to conquer this thing, uh, but in the flesh it conquered her. She was 29. She passed away um, sometime earlier this week. Um, I, I normally don't think of the afterlife. It's normally something that doesn't cross my mind. I don't know why it is. I, I believe, I have a hunch, that a lot of people accepted the Lord. They first accepted Messiah in their hearts for afterlife purposes. I think a lot of people uh, accepted the Lord because they wanted to go to heaven. And uh, accepting the Lord was kind of buying the bus ticket. Fire insurance. There it is. And we're the witness. Fire insurance. Yeah, some people, I think, accepted the Lord um, because they didn't want to go to hell. And they were told that if they don't accept the Lord, they're going to go to hell. And that's why they accepted the Lord. The Lord uses anything to get into us. He'll use absolutely anything to get into us. But, and I respect that. And I, I have very much reverence. I have a lot of reverence for however Yeshua comes into our hearts and manifests himself. My own personal experience is not that one. Um, many of you know I, I was an atheist Jewish atheist, if there's such a thing, yeah, there was such a thing. Um, so I didn't have any belief in God when God found me. I didn't have any belief in afterlife. I didn't care about the afterlife. Um, I wasn't afraid of going to hell. I wasn't all too concerned if I was going to go to heaven. I wasn't really concerned if somebody I loved died. I wasn't really concerned where they were going. Up, down, or left, or right. I was an atheist. So I didn't have much care of that. And when I accepted the Lord, even, it wasn't for myself to get to heaven. It, was, it just wasn't um, in the formula for me. It wasn't to avoid hell for me. When I accepted Messiah into my heart, it's really because I was shacking up with a hot little Christian named Sue. <laughs> who I eventually married. And we started to think, if this thing was going to work, what are we going to do? How is the Christian girl going to get more serious with the Jewish atheist? So we went on the internet and uh, we typed in Judaism plus Christianity. And out popped this thing called Messianic Judaism, which we never heard of before. So I went to, uh, the first congregation I went to was uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn's in New Jersey. And I didn't like it. It wasn't for me. If you're listening, Rabbi Jonathan, it ain't personal. But what Jonathan did was that he sat down with me afterwards for about an hour and started to show me a lot of Messianic prophecies. He introduced me to scripture verses that I've never seen before, like Isaiah 53, like Daniel 9, like Isaiah 9. 
scripture verses in the Jewish Bible that speak about Messiah. So although I did not wind up attending this congregation, he did spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with me. So I wound up going to another congregation, which I liked as a Jewish atheist, because the rabbi had a beard, wore a kippah, wore his tzitzit, and it reminded me of the rabbi that I, you know, knew kind of growing up. So how did I use these things in totally in the natural to kind of make me feel a little comfortable? But it was a divine setup. I can't say that I had initially an encounter with God when I accepted Messiah. I certainly encountered a lot of people who knew God. And that started to break my heart a little bit. I did not, when I eventually accepted Messiah, I did not follow the tra traditional Christian formula of I acknowledge I'm a sinner, I'm in need of a savior, Yeshua is my savior, and I allow him to enter into my heart. It's beautiful. I never said that prayer. It was just one day, I was on the toilet. <laughs> and I said, I guess if you're real, okay. That was my prayer of faith. And I wonder what happened in that moment. And what happens in that moment if you do say, a, a, gen, a, a genuine prayer in the traditional formula. Like what happens in that moment? And I think of these things as we lost our niece. I start thinking of things like afterlife yeah. and salvation. So what happens when you say I accept Yeshua into our Does he just come at that point? Like is Yeshua just not there? And then when you just say a simple prayer, like I accept you Yeshua, shoo! Does he just come into your heart at that moment and at that point in time, what was not there was there? Is that what happened? Is that what happened to me on the toilet? And what's the proof of it? I could tell you shortly after I said that very holy prayer, I probably it was a few days after where I was back in a strip joint. So did it take? You know, sometimes you're sweating and you go into the shower and you come out, you're still sweating, and it's like the shower didn't take. <laughs> That's from Seinfeld, he ate the Kung Pao chicken. It was the Kung Pao! <laughs> it was too spicy. The shower didn't take. So there I am in a strip joint. <coughs> And it wouldn't have been the first time I was at a strip joint after my glorious prayer of faith on the toilet. So did it take? And I wonder these things. I remember this one time, relatively shortly after, there I was at the strip joint with my strip joint friend who accompanied me to the strip joint to said strip joint on a frequent basis. And I remember something happened at this one particular time at said strip joint. It didn't feel right. It didn't feel the same. There was a part of me that liked it, but the part of me even that liked it didn't any longer feel like me. I remember feeling it. I remember like wanting to barf. And I remember this war happening. I never felt it before. Uh -huh. I used to just go there and it was fine. There was, there, was no, there was nothing wrong with it. It was just fine. It was, it, was, it was fine and I liked it. All of a sudden I went there and like I felt there was a part of me that still liked it. And there was a part of me that was completely revolted by it. And they were like at war within me. And I was like, oh, I, I just, I didn't know how to feel. I, it was, it was this weird moment where all of a sudden there was the spirit versus flesh 
wrestling match happening with me, and I felt it for the first time. That was actually the last time I ever stepped into a strip joint. I almost did about six years ago in a very funny moment when we here at Mishkan David at one point had a Bless Israel Day. We were ministering at a Bless Israel Day somewhere in Massachusetts with Rabbi Peter and others. I remember Dawn was there. And uh, we were driving home and I was in my car, baby. That's the first Beatles reference of this Shabbat. And Rabbi Peter was in the car, his van, in front of me. And we were talking on the cell phone. And I said, oh, my king. You know how we talk here in Michigan. Oh, my king. I'll follow you anywhere. And right when I said, anywhere, his left turn signal went on. And he pulled into a strip joint. I think you were with him. And then I said, except there. <laughs> and I kept driving. Because while the Lord at that moment gave him authority and some others to anoint the doors of that strip joint and leave, I believe that's what happened. He didn't give me authority over that. I still was an M in a place where Adonai says, stay way clear. Way, way, way clear. So that was the time I almost went into the strip joint. I only say that story because it's funny. But that was the first, I suppose, evidence back when that my little prayer on the toilet actually meant something. Something in me was growing. So what does this have to do with my niece, who has graduated to dance completely freaking free of addiction with Yeshua? And what does it have to do with salvation? And what does that have to do with where you go when you die? I just think about these things as, we, as we're dealing with this in our family. So I don't know why the traditional Christian formula of saying I'm a sinner and I need a savior, that wasn't my way in. So I'm gonna share a little bit about what salvation is through the understandings of a former Jewish atheist. And here we go. <laughs> wow. Is that a desk?
So the earth he created already on day XYZ, one through, one through six. This is one of those messages that don't work on podcasts. <laughs> this is one of the ones where you just don't bother. It's one of those ones that don't work on podcasts. Just don't even bother. <laughs> it's not going to work. Don't even try. Just don't even bother. Can you post the link? <laughs> Peter's video will suffice. Okay. Yeah. But don't bother with the podcast. It won't work. Don't even try. Okay. So on the sixth day, the Lord did not speak us into existence. He took the earth and started to do this with his hands. He does a lot better job than I did. <laughs> Outcomes what we've called here before, Soil Man. <laughs> so he creates the human being from the dust of the earth. And we know the story of what happened in the garden. We know how Adam and Eve fell. We know that the serpent, who is the accuser, Hasatan, deceived the deceiver, deceived Eve, she ate the apple, the fruit. Adam came in, took a jump, and their little frolic naked in the garden, and not knowing they were naked, came to an end. So they were kicked out of the garden. Angel goes before the garden so they can't enter in again. And the accuser of the brethren, the serpent, was cursed by God to slither around on the ground and to eat the dust of the earth. So here we are, soil man and woman, made of the dust of the earth, okay? And what Satan, the serpent, was relegated to do was eat the dust of the earth. We're made from the dust of the earth. Satan's curse, or can you even say assignment, yeah. is to eat the dust from the earth. Yeah. So addiction comes in from the enemy. And he goes, And some other sin comes in through the enemy, and he goes, Hum. And it doesn't even have to be something like addiction or something that's going to lead. It can just be like something we're struggling with, a, a fear, a, a jealousy. What it is, is the enemy, often, coming in and just going, Hum. So, my niece struggled with that. Satan would come in with his heroin and go like that. And she would go to rehab and she would do her best. And then she'd come out of rehab and Satan would go like this. And then again, over the course of years, like this. Until what was left of the flesh was not compatible with human life. But something happened that even the enemy did not expect. As 
as he was doing his job of eating flesh, eating the dust of the earth, which we're made of, and he took a chomp, and Crystal, in this realm, departed. The enemy, death, thought it won. Death was about to do a victory lap, and it thought it had the right to do a victory lap. It thought it's won the game. It thought, death thought it had the last word. But as it took its last bite, and Crystal departed from this realm, even the enemy, death, encountered something in its eating that it did not expect. And that is this. A seed that was in this earth. So as it was removing the earth, even unto death, there was a seed within this earth that confounded even the enemy. Because while this is perishable, this seed is incorruptible. And no matter how much the enemy will eat at the flesh and eat at the earth, whether it's addiction, whether it's fear, whether it's whatever it is that every single one of us struggle with, at the end of this thing, is an incorruptible, imperishable seed. So death believes it had the last word, but he did not. The word has the last word. And the flesh will never enter the kingdom. It says in the New Testament, a lot of adultery will never enter the kingdom. Greed will never enter the kingdom. You're right. It will be eaten and even go to hell. So if you're like, oh my God, I read that. I'm a adulterer. I'm greedy. Yeah. That part of you will not enter. This will enter. Because the son is the one who inherits the kingdom. The son inherits the kingdom. Even the world knows this. If there's a king in some kingdom and he's going to go, who does he pass it on to? His son. The son enters the kingdom. So any part of all of us, me, you, that's not Messiah, that is not yet Messiah. The enemy is on assignment for that to be eaten and torn away from us. So all that's left of us is the incorruptible seed. It says in the New Testament that Messiah is the seed. Do we know that? Yeah. It says in Galatians 3, Paul said, when it talks about Abraham's seed, this is Rab Shaul, Paul, talking. It doesn't say seeds as in plural. It says seed. Right. Abraham's seed, which is Christ, which is Messiah. And that seed is within the dirt. So why do we have to accept Messiah? Because we're dirt, and he's the seed. Can we put on that seed PowerPoint at the beginning? That's it, you got it. Perfect. We're all created in the image of God. Every one of us. It says right in the beginning, 
Man was created in the image of God. In the New Covenant, it says that Yeshua is the visible image of the invisible God. So we're created, all mankind is created in the image of God. Yes. Here it says, Yeshua is the image of God. It's general math, if A equals B and B equals C, therefore A equals C. If we're created in God's image and Messiah is God's image, we're created in the image of Messiah. So all of us have this, which is a seed in the earth. We all have it. When we have faith, because it comes by faith, what happens when we have faith is this. Do we see the difference? Yeah. Sprout. The sprout, a little sprout. How does this turn into this? Faith. Belief. Simple faith that this is in you. And when we believe it, that the king of glory the incorruptible seed is in us. This is what happens. Yes. Faith is the water that makes this happen. It's not the works of the law that makes this happen. It's faith. According to the people out here, Nothing's really happened to this guy because what's happening is still within the earth. But the Lord is in the process in all of us of doing this and this. I'm telling you, podcasts don't work for this one. And this. And this. And this. Oh yeah! When we're up here, we can look for somebody over here and not see any visible fruit. And wonder, are they saved? Did the prayer of the toilet really stick? Yep. <laughs> yes. God help us. The second one, the second one with the sprout is you with your pants around your head. Okay. Yeah. There we go. There we go. And seeds are pods, by the way. God help us when we are here and we're judging people here. Oh. Or here or here because it hasn't come forth out of the earth yet. Or judging ourselves. God help us when we do that. Because it's only by His grace if we are there, we're there. Only by His grace. And in a moment, He can put us here. In a moment. Because it says, if you judge, you'll be judged. As you are judging. So if you believe you're here, and you're seeing a vessel who's here, what happens in spirit is this. The enemy, Hasatan, we call him the adversary, the enemy, all these things. Hasatan means accuser. He's the accuser. So when we cast judgment on somebody, immediately we are brought in the spirit to the courtroom of Adonai. And Adonai is there on the throne. We're there. The accuser is there. And the one that we're accusing is there. And Hasatan tells the 
judge that this vessel brought an accusation and, and said, there's no fruit going on here. Is that true or not, judge? And the judge says, oh no, there's fruit. Oh, it's there. So then the judge gives the accuser a legal right, a legal right to mess with us when we judge. There's a song that Susie and I love. It's called Mountains on the Ocean Floor. It talks about how there are mountains on the ocean floor <laughs> and how it's rising and nobody sees. So many of us are like that. So many of us have parts of ourselves that are still like this. We may have parts of ourselves that Baruch Hashem are somewhere along that realm over there, but we still have parts of us over here. May I share something? Yeah. Um, this week, I was reading in Matthew um, what we know as the Beatitudes. Please. And, and I noticed in the, in the Beatitudes that the first one says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So I don't know totally what that means, except very simply, poor in spirit indicates to me not much. And then almost like the last one in verse in verse 10, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it says the same thing, the poor in spirit and persecuted for righteousness sake. And faith yes. is, reckon, is reckoned as righteousness. Yes. yes. So I think it's saying what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yes, Baruch Hashem. Thank you, Father. So, my niece Crystal, although the enemy took this and this and this, this, wherever she was, remains. And that is what today is dancing before the throne room in heaven. The only part of any of us that gets redeemed. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. It reminds me, the thing that the verse that comes to me in looking at this is that he is the lifter of our heads that comes to me regarding this. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Adonai. Thank you, Adonai. Thank you, Father. So I guess when I was in that strip joint, I was probably over here. And that was the little thing within me that started a little wrestling match with me. Baruch Hashem. That's all I got. So we're going to take up an offering. And as we take up our offering, in each one of us, wherever we are in this spectrum, there is a piece of us that's somewhere in the spectrum. Uh, we may have faith all good, or we may have no problem walking past the strip joints. But then we may have a part of us, of another, that does. So in that area, they're here. Some of us have strength here, and other places have weakness, and then others are strong in those areas of weakness and are weak in others. So all of us, you, me included, there's a part of us in our flesh that has Messiah within us, but it's just the seed at this point. And you've been wrestling and trying in an area in your life to have that area mature like this, like this diagram shows. Trying is like being saved by the law. Yeah. Yeah. 
even in that one area in your flesh that you know in your spirit Messiah is yet to mature in that area. It is activated. He is activated by faith. So today, as we bring our offering, and as the music continues after that, bring before out of the area within you that you've been trying to conquer. But trying is not what brings forth the fruit. It's faith. By faith, we are saved. And even in that area, Messiah wants to save you in that area. And it will be activated by faith in him. And today, as we bring this forth, we pray, all at Echad, that this, as we leave today, becomes this. It may not be visible to some point in the future, but we bring it before the Lord and may salvation sprout. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you.